So today we're going to finish verses 1 through 10. Then my desire is that next Sunday, hopefully, I can cover the last two major sections of Romans 11. Now, church, uh, we're, we're dealing here with really weighty issues. Uh, there are some, uh, I found, as you know, some commentators who even skip this section of Romans, write nothing about it. There are some, uh, probably many pastors who choose not to deal with this section of Romans. Uh, it's weighty stuff. It can be offensive to people. It can be misunderstood. It can be misused. And so, I want us to begin this morning and with a word of prayer and commit, once again, what we are studying, the Word of God that we have before us. You see, I, when I come to texts like this, and I had been warned by friends, fellow pastors who had already preached through Romans. I'd been warned about 9, 10, and 11. And um, the question I asked myself, well, what, do you, what am I supposed to do when I come to a text like Romans, Romans 11? What am I supposed to do? Do I skip it? And I couldn't get peace about skipping the chapter. Now, I don't plan to tell you that I understand it all, but I believe we're supposed to preach it. And we come to it, as we come to it, we come to it with humility. Understanding that this is God's Word. And God revealed it to Paul. Paul wrote it, and it was given to us. And so we're to look at it, and we're to receive it as God's Word in a humble way, knowing that whether we understand it or not, or whether we totally agree with what the preacher says or not, it is good for us. The Word of God is good for us. No matter how difficult it may seem, it's good for us. And so let's pray this morning as we begin. Our Father, we want to thank you this morning for Romans 11. And we pray as we humbly approach this text today that you would open our hearts and that you, Holy Spirit, you would do a work in us that needs to be done. And that when we're finished today, we will leave here with a greater sense of responsibility that we have as your people to be people who spread the gospel. Understanding that God is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over election. That is, we believe from Paul's teaching that he has chosen many to come to know Christ and he has passed over many. So we humbly approach this text and pray that you will speak through a fallible preacher this morning and teach us for your glory and our good and the salvation of the lost. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, let's read now these ten verses again this morning. Paul says, I say then, has God cast away Israel? That is, did God reject Israel? And his reply, as we saw last week, certainly not. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I am left, I alone am left, and they seek my life. What does the divine response say to them? What does God say to him, that is Elijah? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then... At this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. 
What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks. We'll look at that in depth this morning. See, that's the question we need to ask. What was Israel seeking? But the elect have attained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. And then quoting the psalm, Psalm 69, David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their backs always. Some translations say, bend their, their backs forever. Now, as I look at chapter 11, what we see here is a response that Paul expected to come from his fellow Jews. And that response, that there were several, and this one is, did God reject, did God cast away Israel? And Paul is going to answer that in our text today with three sweeping summaries. Actually, in the chapter 11, there, as I said earlier, there are three sweeping summaries of Paul's answer to that. Today, in verses 1 through 10, his answer is, there is a believing remnant. And that's what I want to cover this morning. Next Sunday, I want to cover part two. There was the temporary rejection of the Jews. And then, thirdly, we'll see as the chapter closes up, there is a future salvation for Israel. So this morning, let's look at this first one, the believing remnant. Paul has stated in his, that his own conversion is an example that there is a remnant. I'm a Jew. He said, I'm an Israelite. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a descendant of Abraham. Paul said, I have been saved. I have been converted. Now, brothers and sisters, we have to think about who this is and what he's saying and get this into context to really appreciate what Paul is saying here. I try to apply this in modern day terms and think of some modern examples. And lately, uh, in the news lately, there have been some evil people in our news. And I'm thinking of the, the, the uh, tyrant ruler of North Korea. In fact, I just heard on the news this week. On Fox News, an expert telling us how many people, how many Christians and people of other faiths around the world are being persecuted today for their faith. And we automatically think about the first century. But more people are being persecuted for their faith today than ever before in history. And one of those persecutors is Kim Jong-un in North Korea. He is an evil man. Now just imagine, though, that he comes to know Jesus Christ. Now at first you would doubt that conversion, wouldn't you? You would question whether it was genuine or not. This is an evil man. Well, that's exactly what happened in Paul's day. He was converted to Christianity. He saw Christ as the Messiah. And, and nobody believed him at first. So this ought to be encouraging to us. Look at his past. Paul was without question the most calculating, bloodthirsty enemy of the church. And if Saul, a hardened religious man, hardened to the core, with blood on his hands, if he is converted, then there's hope for anyone in the world today. You remember after Paul's conversion, he tries to, after he comes back from his, his retreat, he, he, comes, he comes back and he tries to uh, get to know the disciples, if you will, and they rejected him, except one. Who was that that, who believed Paul and he became the peacemaker among the disciples? Remember his name? Barnabas. Have it not been for Barnabas, I think the disciples would have cast him out. But Barnabas was a peacemaker, and he convinced the other disciples, this is a true conversion, we need to listen to this man. Now the point 
of this argument here, or the point that Paul's making here, is that, look, I am a part of the remnant. And then in our text, he does something that he hasn't done yet. He, so far, Paul has used very rational, logical arguments to build his case in Romans. But now that in this chapter, for the first time, he's going to set upon an Old Testament story and remind his fellow Jews of this great event that they knew about that happened in the Old Testament. And it's a story that takes place in 1 Kings 18 and 19. He tells the story, this picture of Israel's history, of how God worked during some of the darkest days of Israel's history. You know what he's saying to his fellow Jews? Look at your history. Remember your history. You'll learn a lot about God if you remember your history. And I challenged you last Sunday, think about your history. Think about your past and how God has worked in your life. It's a miracle that some of you are here this morning. It's a work of God. You have a history, and it's a history of God's faithfulness. And Israel had a history, a history of God's faithfulness. He takes them back to the story of Elijah. And you remember that story, don't you? This was in a dark time in Israel's history. In fact, Israel had a had a, an unrighteous king by the name of Ahab, and his wife was even worse. And uh, there was Elijah the prophet, and he was battling against the prophets of Baal. Israel had turned to Baal worship. Ahab the king was worshiping Baal. His wife was worshiping Baal. And so Elijah, and you remember the story? He calls together the prophets of Baal and he says, I'll challenge you today and we'll see who, has the, who knows the true God. So he challenged the prophets of Baal to build a wooden altar. And you put your ram upon the altar and call down fire from, from your God. You call out to Baal your God and let him consume your sacrifice and I'll do the same. I'll call on the God of Israel, the God of... Isaac and Jacob. And so the prophets of Baal, it says, they built their wooden altar and they laid their, they cut their ram into pieces and laid it on the wood. And at morning time, when the sun rose, they began to call out to Baal. Nothing. All morning long, they cried out to Baal to come and consume this offering with fire. It said noontime came. Nothing had happened. They even waited to the evening time of prayer to cry out to Baal again. You know why nothing happened? Because Baal was a dead God, a false God, a God of the imagination, a God made with human hands. And then Elijah, Elijah built his altar of wood. He put stone around it, dug trenches around it, and then he divided up the ram, laid it on the altar, and then he had the priest come in and pour water all over the altar, so much water that the water filled the trenches around the altar. And then Elijah cried out to God. And the Bible says that God rained down fire from heaven. So much fire came down from heaven that it consumed the sacrifice, consumed the wood, even melted the stones around the altar. The water was evaporated. And as a result of that, building upon that great momentum, Elijah seizes the opportunity and he has 400 of the prophets and priests of Baal killed that day. It was a great victory. Now news of that reaches Ahab, this unrighteous king of Israel at that time. He was wicked to the core. And then he told his wife, who was worse than he was. Remember her name? Jezebel. Nobody names their daughter Jezebel today, do they? Jezebel heard about it and she said, before the sun is down tomorrow, I'll have his head. I'll kill that prophet. Elijah. Now, can you imagine this? He's probably 
emotionally, physically exhausted after going through this great test of wills on that day. And Elijah the prophet hears that Jezebel's got a price on his head, wants him dead. And he loses confidence in God. Just for a moment. He loses confidence in God. Flush from this great victory, he, he gets discouraged. And ultimately, he flees. Now the first night that he's away, he's running, he sleeps under a tree and the angel of the Lord comes and nourishes him, feeds him. You know what he's doing, the angel of the Lord? He's preparing Elijah for a long journey. He's got a 40 day journey ahead of him. And the Lord sent this angel to nourish Elijah and encourage him. And then Elijah went on this 40 day journey to Mount Horeb, which is in the Sinai Desert. This is the same place where Moses met with God. And after that 40 day journey, it says that Elijah found a cave and he stayed in that cave. And then God showed up. And God came and he passed in front of the cave. And he passed there with great fire. Passed there with great wind and a great earthquake. And then he asked Elijah, Elijah, why are you here? What's going on? You know what Elijah says? He says, Lord, I've been zealous for you all my life. And the Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've broken down your altars. This is in 1 Kings 19. They've put your prophets to death by the sword. And I'm the only one left. You know what God's response was? He didn't chide him. You would think he would, but he didn't. He took care of him again. He nourished him and encouraged him. Then he passed by the cave again and asked him the same question. And Elijah gave him the same reply. There's no one left but me. And then, you know what God said? And this is what's pertinent to our text today. Then God said something to Elijah that we can't miss because Paul quotes it here in Romans 11. God said to Elijah, Yet I have 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. You know what he's saying? Elijah thought he was the only one. God said, I have a remnant. I've always had a remnant, Elijah. Even in the darkest periods of Israel's history, God was preserving a remnant. And Paul is saying to his Hebrew brothers and sisters that God even now has a remnant of Jews. This is the point that we've come to this morning. The proof is in the fact that even in the darkest days of Israel's history, even in times of great apostasy, apostasy like the days of Elijah, by God's own account, 7,000 Jews were still faithful to the God of Jehovah and they refused to bow their knee to Baal. And now, we're in Paul's time. Paul is saying... Today, now, Israel is in national apostasy. But he believes there's more Jewish believers than most would think. There's a remnant. It's so interesting today that we're on this word remnant. If you go back there in the fellowship hall, and I told the ladies this morning when I went back there, you look at all those uh, quilts they've made, and they're made out of remnants. So I don't have to really tell you that's the illustration this morning of what a remnant is. There are pieces that God has preserved. One day He's going to put all these pieces together and you're going to see something magnificent, something beautiful out of all these remnants that God is preserving. You know the word remnants used 62 times in the, in the Bible, 62 times in the Old Testament, three times in the New Testament. The last time it's used in the Bible is in our text today when Paul speaks of remnant. So, as we finish out these ten verses, there are three questions 
questions that we need to answer concerning this issue of God hardening the hearts of some. The first one is this. What is the hardening? Look at verses 8 through 10. Now this is where we're going to focus now as we finish up today. In 8 through 10, Paul quotes Old Testament passages. He's quoting Isaiah 29 first, and then Deuteronomy 29, and then Psalm 69 to prove his point. He's going to answer this question for us. What is the hardening? Look at 8 and 10. Paul said, just as it is written, look at your text, look at your scriptures. You have the scriptures. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. Then he says, to this very day. See, a spirit of stupor is a spirit of numbness or insensitivity. It's the result of they were spiritually blind and deaf. Eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear. That's what this hardening is. A spiritual stupor. And then in verse 9, he quotes Psalm 69. And if, you, if you've read Psalm 69, don't, don't turn to it today. I'll just share some of it with you. But Psalm 69 is a psalm of cursing. David is praying down cursing, curses on Israel because they have turned away from the God of Israel. Once again, they've been, they're worshiping false gods. And David is calling down these curses upon Israel. And guys, listen, when the biblical writers were reading Psalms, Psalms like Psalm 69, where David is talking, and he's calling down curses upon a people who has rejected the true God. What biblical theologians and biblical teachers are, will do with this text is they see it as prophetic. David, the king, is a type of Christ, the king. See, the son of David comes and... He is also rejected. And so when you read Psalm 69, you can read it as prophetic. As David even looking ahead to the days when the son of David would come and he would be rejected by his own people. As they were rejected in the days of David and even before because their hearts had been hardened. And now as Paul writes... Israel's hearts had been hardened again. So he reads the curses of Psalm 69, I think Paul does, as divine judgment upon Israel, spoken by God through David. The days would come when the nation of Israel would reject the Son of God. And then something interesting is said in verse 9. Did you pick this up? Look at verse 9. And David says, another cursing, let their table become a snare and a trap. Now think about that for a minute. When I was reading that text, I came across, let their table. Well, what table is he referring to? Well, I think he's referring to the same kind of tables that we have in our home, maybe different design, but tables where they would come together as a people, as a family, and enjoy the simple yet wonderful blessings of God. And yet David says, I pray that their tables would become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block. Now how would that be? Well, think about this. Think about our tables today and what they represent. Some of you are going to go home today and you're going to gather around the table in your home and you're going to have a Sunday meal. And I know what some of you husbands say and wish that happened, but you're going to have to take them out to a McAllister's or something. And you're going to sit around a table at McAllister's or Jason's Deli or wherever you're going today. And, but you're going to sit around a table and with family members and you're going to enjoy what? The good things that God provides. The common graces. 
it just, that's what the table represents. Simple yet good things that God gives us. And yet what happens is that so often the very good things that God gives us to bring enjoyment to our life, you know what we do? We learn to find our satisfaction in those things, find our pleasure in those things, rather than in the God who gives them. One time I took a friend out to lunch and I said, let's pray. He said, is it really necessary to pray <laughs> over every meal? I mean, he was, he's a Christian. He was serious. He says, is that really necessary? And I, I was almost appalled. Because, I mean, I just thought, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we want to give thanks to God for this meal we're about to receive and enjoy? And yet, we don't. We find pleasure in that meal more than we find pleasure in God. If you don't think that's true, then you need to be reminded 60% of Americans are overweight. We find more pleasure in food than we do in God. We find more pleasure in leisure than we do in God, and leisure is a good thing. We find more pleasure in our bank accounts than we do God, and there's nothing sinful about money in and of itself. So we can conclude here that the hardness of hearts includes the misuse of the simple good things, gifts that God gives us, the common graces. And the pleasure that they get in these things, that Israel got in these things, replaced pleasure they should have found in God. And so their physical appetites for food, their appetites for sex, their appetites for just aesthetic pleasures, leisure, sport, all of these things can end up deadening the spiritual appetites. And finally, they lose their desire for God. And then he goes on and says in verse 10, he says this, Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bend their backs forever. Now what do you see in your mind's eye there? When he says bend their backs forever, they're bowed down with the load that they carry. They're bent over. That's how they're going through life. They've been over with this burden that they've placed upon themselves. And sometimes that happens when we find pleasure in material possessions and we live just to accumulate more and more. You know what they end up doing? They become a burden to us. And we go through life carrying this heavy burden upon our back. But I think true to the context of Romans 11, I think what Paul was probably referring to here within the context is how many people construct a morality that makes our works, not God's grace, the basis of our religion and our life. And listen, and this applies to us too, it happened to the Jews. This is what Paul is saying that happened to his very nation who should have known the Messiah, the giver of righteousness, he said, you have sought what? Life in a different way. You've looked for it in other ways. What did they want? What did Israel desire? They desired, they desired eternal life. Israel wanted to be right with, right with God, but they looked for it in the wrong place. And they took the law. In other words, they turned the law on itself. It, it became legalism. And it becomes a burden. And they're carrying this through their life, bent over by legalism, by the law. You see, if you're seeking to find righteousness with God through self-righteousness, it will become a tyranny in your life. You see, legalism is a tyranny. This it's what hardening is. Spiritual numbness, blindness, deafness, and turning the gifts of God into 
God replacing pleasures and God's law into self-reliant labor. Be careful. Be careful with your attitude about the law and about why you come to church and why you do this. We have been made right through Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is found in His finished work. Why would we burden ourselves under the tyranny of the law? And the second question that Paul answers is, when did this happen? Well, look, he's quoting verse 29. He says, to this day the Lord has not given, not given you a heart to understand, or eyes to see, or hear. You know who he's quoting? Moses. And Moses was writing 1,400 years before Paul wrote. And Moses says, to this day, in other words, it began before Moses even wrote it. All that time, all these years, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see. And then the question, how long will that remain? Well, you know what? Our first week we looked over in verse 25 and we found what I think is the answer to that. Look over in verse 25. Paul says, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until, you see that word, until? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, you know what? I learned several things from that. What I'm learning here, as I study this text, is that God began the hardening. It came from God at His pleasure and He will put an end to it in His timing. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And I take that to mean world evangelism. When the gospel has been taken around the world and God is satisfied with that effort, the time of the Gentiles will end. And it seems to me what Paul is saying is the day's coming when there will once again be a day for Israel. And God will open up the doors of heaven and draw Jews to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? It's God's word. That's God's promise. Now look, i got to close with this. And this is the hard thing. I don't, I don't claim to understand this. What's the basis of this heart? See, these, these are, again, they're weighty issues. And Anybody want to finish the sermon? You're welcome. What's the basis for the hardening? Well, one thing we've learned for sure. Those who are hardened are not passed over because they are worse. And those who are chosen are not chosen because they're any better. Otherwise, Paul says, grace would not be grace. So, how do we describe the basis of this hardening? Well, there's, there's two things we can say. One thing we can say for sure is that God is free. We can stress the freedom of God. He is not bound by any outside influence or force. His will is not dictated by any external thing. God is completely free. And anything He does is right or righteous. We know that. The second thing we know for sure is the other way is to stress the guilt 
and accountability of all men. See, Richard Hall deserves hell. And so does Dr. Ted Rendell. He's a pretty nice guy. I've been around him a little bit. But he deserves to go to hell. We all do. And Paul explains that they've been judicially hardened because they persisted in a pattern of works thinking they could make themselves righteousness. So that's why Paul writes what he does in verses 6 and 7. They were hardened as a judgment for their unbelief. It happened to Pharaoh. God hardened his heart so God would be glorified and Pharaoh would become an international demonstration of the sovereignty and power of God. But here it happens to God's own people, Israel, who should have known. They were especially blessed. And the text says God has given them, Israel, a spirit of stupor. Now how do we apply this today as we close? How can we be challenged by this? First of all, we need to remember that there's a limit to God's patience. This needs to be, should be sobering to Jews and to Gentiles alike. That's a universal principle. If anyone hears the truth and does not respond to it, the time can come when he or she will be incapable of responding to it. In Israel's case, there was a, a judicial punishment. That's the language that Paul has used. Judicial retribution for failure to see the God-given faculties to perceive His manifested power and to glorify Him. And, and I, as a pastor, I would say this, who preaches week after week to his congregation, sometimes I sense that there are some who are dead to the Word of God. And to me, that's a terrifying thing. That people would sit in a Christian church and hear the preaching of the Word and be dead to the Word. You know why some of the Pharisees couldn't understand Jesus and what He was saying is because they didn't understand because they had not appropriated the truth that God had already given them. This is a warning to us who hear the Word of God week after week after week and we never respond in any way to the preaching of truth. Well, let me close with this. My prayer is that God might grant us, all of us, to make our calling and election sure, as Peter says in 2 Peter 1. We make that election sure by the way that we love people around us, all peoples, Jew or Gentile. And we remember that no one can give God a compelling reason why He should allow them into heaven other than the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then let's join Paul in a passionate pursuit to pray and to witness and to love and to win as many people as we can by the grace of God. That's our commission. Pray with me this morning. Take a few minutes as we close our service to consider this. What my response should be, your response should be.
You know, one of the things that I think would really encourage you this week in your life as we consider these really, really hard issues here is to think about your history and go back as far as you can go, as far as you can remember as a child, your earliest days. Then begin to put together the pieces and try to remember certain people that God brought into your life or certain circumstances that took place in history that had an impact, direct impact on your family and caused a major dysfunction or a move or a relocation and you begin to put all of those things together and you look back and you see how God has graciously been working his divine will I thought about my family this week and I went back to days before I was ever born when the depression came in 1929 and the Hall family who lived in Arkansas, they were very poor people. They had to make a move. And they traveled to Detroit, Michigan. Left the farm fields of Arkansas to go to Michigan to find work. It was a discouraging time for them. My father tells me about that told me about that. And yet, 30 years later, my dad would return to that suburb and find a job with the auto industry. And a co-worker by the name of Mr. Bacon would invite my mother and dad to church. And they went to hear a man named John R. Rice preach. And they came to know Jesus. Every person in this room has some kind of history like that. Remember your history. See the hand of God working in your life. I would have not known Jesus had it not been for a man named Mr. Bacon who shared the gospel with my father when he was in his late 20s. Years later, that same dad would sit down and open the word of God to a six-year-old boy and share the gospel with him take me to church to hear the preaching of the gospel. And years later, I would share the gospel with other people. A junior high teacher in the early 70s would take a Bible from me, her student. I gave it to her as a witness of Christ. And Twenty years later, I see that lady, that teacher again, and she comes up to me and takes a Gideon New Testament out of her Bible that I gave to her 20 years earlier and said, I've come to know Jesus. So as we study these hard texts, brothers and sisters, Leave here with the understanding that God is a gracious God. He wants to save people from their sins. He's a loving God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the God we serve. Father, I pray as we 
leave this place this morning. I commend these people to you as yours. I thank you for the opportunity to shepherd and pastor wonderful people like this who would listen to difficult texts that even a preacher doesn't fully understand, but yet receive it. I pray you'll use these words in the hearts of people this week, especially in the hearts of anyone here today whose heart has been hardened, but now the Holy Spirit is softening their heart to be receptive to the seeds of the words of the gospel, and I pray that you will save them this week. As we've sung this morning, our God saves. Save the lost. Save people through our witness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, stand with me and receive the Lord's blessings as you leave today. If any of you have a special need, you'd like me to pray with you or one of the other elders, we will stick around and pray with you today. And I pray, thanking you for your patience today, I pray the Lord will bless you and keep you. He'll make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you and He'll lift up His countenance toward you and give all of you peace. Amen.